All righty. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to our first webinar of 2021. And welcome back if you have joined us before. Today's webinar topic is security concerns with cloud enablement. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Raquel Rodriguez, the events manager here at Security Compass, and your host for today's webinar. Before we get started with today's webinar, I'd like to give you a quick overview of Security Compass. For those of you who may not be aware of us until today, Security Compass was founded in 2004 and began with a team of experienced penetration testers. Today, we have come far and work with many large enterprises globally to manage their cybersecurity risk through balanced development automation. We have three key offerings. Our flagship product, SD Elements, enables organizations to deliver software quickly and reduce costs through automation. Our modular role-based e-learning solutions empower organizations to embrace DevSecOps, and our strategic advisory services offer expertise in cloud security, pen testing, and red teaming for a better security posture. Now let's quickly go through some housekeeping items. As you may have noticed, you've all entered the session on mute to reduce background noise. Second, a recording of this webinar will be available after today's event. You will receive an email with the link to this recording, and we will also be publishing the recording in the resources section of our website. Also, we encourage everyone to raise questions. Please submit your question into the chat and we'll address them during the Q&A session. Lastly, if you would like to follow up with us or you have a topic you'd like to see covered in a future webinar, please email us at contact at securitycompass.com. Like I mentioned, today's webinar topic is security concerns with cloud enablement, and we brought together an experienced panel who can offer their perspective on cloud adoption from a security perspective. I'm pleased to have here with me Ruth G. Lennon, a lecturer at Letterkenny Institute of Technology, Spencer Coe, offensive security professional at Reddit, I Han Tech, VP of InfoSec at Cyber Electra, and Altez Villani, Director of Insights Research at Security Compass. Thank you all for being here with me today. So why don't we get started? Altez, I'll hand it over to you. Great, thanks Raquel, appreciate it. As Raquel had mentioned, uh, please don't hesitate. If you've got any questions, uh, feel free, put them in the chat, put them in the Q&A. Let's make this uh, really dynamic uh, and uh, have everyone kind of contribute to the conversation that we're having today. So really what we're going to talk about is security and cloud enablement. It's a big topic. We've got a lot of organizations that are interested today in trying to uh, move forward with the cloud. And what we want to do is we want to put a fence around our discussion today, specifically from a security lens standpoint. Uh, and the way we're going to do this in order to try and uh, somehow develop a framework that we can contain our conversation with, uh, we're going to approach this with a pretty common framework around the people, process, and technology elements. Uh, and, and we're going to look at it from a security perspective with the context of cloud enablement. So when we start off here by looking at it from a people perspective, first of all, we want to start to explore a couple of different uh areas here. First, are there any new roles that are emerging because of this need for cloud? And the second, are there any existing roles that will change as a result of the cloud? So what I'd like to do is uh, I'm going to just uh, start straight off by asking our, our panelists here. Uh, Spencer, from your perspective, when we look at it from a people standpoint, what are your thoughts on cloud enablement, either from the perspective of a new role that's emerging or an existing role that needs to get modified for cloud enablement? Sure. So I, I think a lot of this is, you know, the, the big question is, do we retool people, right? And hopefully that answer is yes. Like that's my personal belief. But that, that is, you know, if I look at the translation from when we used to run DCs on-prem to moving stuff into the cloud, it's really the same type of problems. There's a lot of, you know, there, there's the, the cloud like roles and responsibilities matrix that you can find online of you know, things that are now AWS or Azure's problem uh, versus ours. A lot of our problems are still the same. So you still have network folks that are now doing just you know, different networking up in the cloud. Uh, you have infrastructure folks who are doing different types of infrastructure activities. The onus of some of the operations is now a, you know, a cloud provider problem, but you still have those people needing to perform some sort of job. Um, so I think a lot of that is just you know, if, if we retool people and we get, you know, uh, continuous education of this is what it means to now do that thing that used to be done five, 10 years ago, 
now in the cloud, then a lot of those ro those roles migrate directly. There are, I think there are some new ones, uh, particularly around like management and governance, which we probably missed in the DC days. Like it's really cool that, that a cloud provider will auto magically give you a whole bunch of asset inventory data. And it's probably stuff that people haven't ever had before or, or it was really hard or you had to beg a, a, a managed service provider to tell you like, what do you actually own? But now we have that at our fingertips. And so this opens up new opportunities that we can do better governance around the things that we actually do own, looking better at price, looking at better at optimization. So I think there's definitely a lot of new roles in that efficiency and, and operationalization space that are gonna come out of a move into a cloud. Hmm. Interesting. Ruth, your thoughts on this? Yeah, couldn't agree more. Um, I, as soon as you started talking about the new roles, the, the first thing that jumped to mind is uh, the, the role of AI and people who do or use AI, ML, uh, particularly around cartography. Um, we know what we've got in our data center, we think we're wrong often, more often than not, or more often at least than we'd like to admit to. But when it gets out into the cloud and we're doing hosted services and you're using two providers because you're trying to provide that extra reliability, you miss things. And you needn't say you don't, we all do. Of course you do, that gets fairly natural. But are we seriously taking these audits? Are we seriously looking at this on a regular basis? Then you start throwing in um, serverless and stuff like that. Now the problem becomes significantly worse because in some instances, and to be fair, it's not all, but in some instances, you have somebody building it badly, poorly, and, and those services stay live. They were never designed to stay live, but they're staying live, and that gives you a backdoor in. And then people forget that, hey, you know what? That serverless stuff, it sits inside a container. It sits inside a VM anyway. So, you know, we need to keep an eye on that too. That kind of management at a at a an analysis level to really seriously look at what we've got versus what we planned and how long do we keep it? That needs to be done by somebody and that's long overdue. And yeah, mm. there are there are automation tools out there, but come on, we need people to be a bit more aware of why we need them so that the funds can be put in so we can get the people we need. I, yeah, think, so I think to me, that's the bigger problem is we're not getting the funds to try and look after security the way we need to. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Ihan, do you have some thoughts on this? Yeah, absolutely. I agree with kind of just the root as well on that. Uh, I always give this analogy, uh, Altas. Moving to the cloud is, is like a kind of just a similar thing to that moving uh, from a kind of the standalone house into a very kind of just a luxury high rise uh, apartment building, right? Uh, as you can imagine, in both places, you do have your kind of just your basic infrastructure, like the, the electricity, the, the plumbing, and so on, right? Again, in both kind of just uh, places, you perform some kind of just the activities like cooking, mm -hmm. watching and watching the TV and the, the other kind of just the stuff over there, right? You are doing the, the same thing, whether you live in a kind of the standalone house or high rise luxury apartment over there, right? However, there is a huge difference in what comes with the, the building over there. Right. In your luxury apartment, maybe you're going to have the kind of just the gym, elevators, cleaning services, uh, and some kind of just the security services as well. Right. Maybe a swimming pool. So uh, someone is kind of just providing and maintaining them for you. Right. Instead of you kind of just uh, doing the, the hard work. Right. Someone is just doing this for you. So uh, in essence, you are sharing these services with the, the other kind of just uh, the, the occupants or tenants, right? So you need to kind of just to the adjust your routines accordingly, and you have to kind of just to the live in harmony. So from people perspective, yes, there are some kind of just to the new roles out there that you need to kind of just to catch or disharmony. And also you need to change some kind of just to the behaviors so that whatever you were kind of just doing in your old standalone house, you will kind of just do the same things in the high rise, uh, you know, the, the luxury apartment uh, altas. It's a kind of just a culture shift, right? Mainly, but having said that, there are some kind of just new roles, especially from, as Ruth mentioned, from AI ML perspective, or the kind of just, uh, you know, the, the configuration perspective, and the kind of just innate to the cloud, uh, you are sharing uh, responsibility perspective. There are some new rules that we see out there as well. Mm -hmm. Interesting. 
So, so as we look at it really at a, at a very high level, um, what we want to try to achieve here from a security practitioner's perspective is we would like to retool wherever possible. Yes, there may be situations where people don't understand the cloud fully, but we have a responsibility as a security community to help bring people along. Uh, you know, there are already existing uh, competencies around managed services, hosted services. Can we leverage those to help them think about, for example, what it means to be in the cloud? It doesn't preclude the fact that there would be new roles emerging around governance um, and, and specific contexts will emerge out of that. AI, ML, some of the things that we talked about. Uh, and then really looking at uh, this shared responsibility model. And this is where some of the governance is, is really going to become important because now when we look at an application, there's part of the responsibility for the, the operations of this application in the cloud resides with a third party and part of it resides internally. And I think this makes sense now for us to kind of flip this over and, and, and start to think about the process elements from a cloud standpoint. Uh, so we spoke about the, 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 the people side now, when we look at the process, uh, when it, as far as it pertains to the cloud, there are a couple of different angles to this. On the one hand, we've got our typical software development lifecycle. And this is all about the, the factory that produces these artifacts in terms of build and code and these types of things that go out uh, and, and get deployed into this cloud infrastructure. But there's another part of the process, which is new. It's a new environment. So how do we govern this environment? Who's got access to it? Who's got access to deploy to it? Who's got access to make sure or who's responsible for ensuring that we don't have orphaned instances in the cloud, for example. And so I'd like to dig a little bit deeper within these two contexts, one being the software development process itself and the other one being more the governance, which we hinted at when we started to take a look at the people side. And I'd like to start, Ruth, from your perspective, if you look at these two broad processes, what are your thoughts on cloud enablement from a security practitioner's perspective? It's actually really interesting to look at it from the governance side, which is something I've been doing for the last few weeks. Um, one of the, the things that I do is uh, I tend to work with organizations like the NSAI, which is the standards body for Ireland and the ISO. ISO. And the reason for that is there are a bunch of standards out there to cover the various aspects and that's all great. Who's in control of them and how are they being developed? So if you look at a, a software standard, a, a general software standard, and you could say, okay, right, that, that's the software side of the house, that's not us, but it is us. It's our mm -hmm. automation software. And is there anybody from the tech side, anybody from the distributed cloud side, your TC um, 11s, are they looking at this from their side of the field? And they're not. There aren't that level of wars yet over how these standards are applied because the lines are completely blurred now between hardware and software. Also, another thing to look at is the fact that those standards were written with the concept that the hardware is there, it's set, it's something very specific. We build our software to suit the, the hardware that's there. And again, that's not the case anymore. Now we're looking at adapting that hardware to the needs of the software. We're taking it completely flipped on its head. So the governance side of it, well, as far as standards are concerned, it's not there yet. So then look at it at the organization level. How can they comply with a standard when the standard's not up to date? So they need to try and pull something together, a process that they're defining uniquely for that company. And that just doesn't work. It really mm -hmm. doesn't. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So let me uh, just ask you then, Ihan, your thoughts on the process on each of those two areas, whether it's on the software development side or on the on the cloud governance side, thoughts? Right. Uh, I'll ask, uh, in order to security risk practitioners can adjust uh, the, the, uh, enable the, the secure cloud journey from process perspective, first, there needs to be a kind of just a strong security risk culture established in the, the organizations. Uh, I think Ruth hinted this. Uh, when we look at the security risk culture, we see that uh, it is built on two pillars, right? Uh, the first one is security governance, and the other one is, is kind of just the leadership. 
these two components must coexist. And you cannot, unfortunately, have only one and expect a secure cloud journey over there, right? So if there is a leadership without the security governance, then you can expect the tyranny and you can expect the chaos in that organization. I call these organizations wild, wild west. Fast, they are fast, but they are not secure. Right? We see that uh, the, the adoption of the cloud services uh, by the line of business leaders, they act like five-year-old in a candy store, right? They buy the, the cloud technologies and services without a sound strategy, without a centralized approach, or without any kind of just the standards as Ruth mentioned, or without the kind of just the security architecture involvement, right? There are multiple cloud initiatives, each led by different business uh, department. And this, this is chaos, right? And it kind of just poses huge security concern from the kind of just a process perspective, right? Because it's kind of just bringing lots of risk. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, Altas, if you have security governance, but no leadership, then you can expect the bureaucracy and you can expect the delays in those organizations, right? Business is trying to kind of just leverage the disruptive technologies, be it a cloud or kind of the DevOps, but your rigid governance practices are slowing them down. I call these organizations slow and not necessarily secure, but surely uh, they, they will file, fall behind the kind of just uh, the, the competition uh, organizations, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, organizations must maintain a balance between the, the governance and leadership so that they can realize that the full benefits of the, the cloud and cloud processes. Uh, of course, I mean, it's easier said than done, uh, how do they do that? How, do, how the organizations can kind of just strike the right balance between the, the kind of just to the speed and also the kind of just self service enablement services. So there are tons of things to do about us here in this area, right? But uh, they need to kind of just start from the, I think the cloud strategy and vision so that there's an alignment with the business goals and objectives over there, right? They should be bringing stakeholders together first and they have to determine what cloud adoption means to the organization, uh, how the key stakeholders will benefit or how to connect their business goals and outcomes uh, to, to kind of just the enabling technologies such as cloud, DevOps, et cetera, right? And what is the risk appetite? And most of the organizations today, they, they don't kind of just to take this into consideration, right? They don't kind of just to define the, the risk appetite thresholds, right? And how do they measure the, the value they, they are not kind of just, uh, uh, you know, putting uh, meaningful kind of just the measurement techniques over there, right? Then once you kind of just have this vision, you have to put this vision into the kind of just the cloud security policy as well, right? And make sure that you are articulating and you are kind of just socializing this vision with the, everyone in the organization so that people know how to kind of just uh, act on, on them, right? This is not happening on the kind of just, uh, most of the process side as well. Once you kind of just establish your vision, then you have to kind of just work on the, the tactical security plan over there, right? Uh, you have to kind of just to govern the, the, your vision with the, the cloud security standards, as Ruth mentioned. I mean, we, we don't have standards over there, right? And also with your kind of just to the security process and procedures and the defined roles and responsibilities as well, right? During this tactical planning phase, uh, you need to kind of give your priority to, the, to your most valuable assets, which is your people, right? You got to educate them about the, the cloud security journey, right? You have to kind of just to develop their skills and capabilities, right? And once you outline your tactical plan, and then you can kind of just work on the kind of just the technology when you people, when you kind of just finish the people and uh, process side of it. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And, and really, when we take a look at, uh, some of the policies and some of the processes and priorities as they map against risk, it really starts to now begin to look like uh, the development of competencies that are really around cloud enablement. So on the one hand, we've got the business that is looking to enable cloud or is actually looking to, to acquire cloud in, in the hopes of enabling either uh, some new set of services or enhancing existing services in the form of either revenue generation or cost reduction. 
but in order to do that, we need to ensure that uh, the people that we've got are all choreographed and their govern the governance structure is set up in such a way that the controls that we've got in, in the form of these policies adhere to the priorities of the business and still manage the risk at the same time. Uh, and I'm, I'm definitely hearing that that's, uh, you know, the approach to, to take, do it with eyes open, understanding the value this is going to provide. And it, it really helps uh, on a separate discussion around making a sound business case for cloud enablement. And I think security has a role to play in that uh, as, as we look at the ongoing value that, that cloud could provide. Let me flip over to you, Spencer. I'd like to hear your thoughts now as well from a process standpoint. And then when, when you're done, Spencer, I'd like to see if we can maybe put up our first poll uh, and, and pull the audience around kind of their journey and where they're at from a cloud standpoint. So Spencer, you wanna kick it off and just tell us a bit of your thought or your thinking around our uh, process? Yeah, and I really like IHAN's strategic kind of view of what that means from a cloud enablement perspective. Um, I'm gonna touch a little on the software development uh, aspect of it, uh, kind of being a, a DevSecOps type person. Uh, I think it's definitely a benefit, right? So it's, uh, the thing that, that a lot of security folks do is like, oh, cloud's scary, it's a lot of new risks, it's, it's unknown. Uh, I think that's maybe a little bit of a, a misnomer because with cloud comes kind of a, a leveling of the playing fields and a transparency that maybe hadn't existed before because you are now forced into using a cloud service a particular way, right? Like I can't go to AWS and say, I want to do EC2 way different. Um, no, you're going to get that stock service like everyone else. Um, and then especially as more things are becoming more SaaS and less, you know, I'm just getting bare metal to run things on, you are be being given some, some already existing processes that now you can start actually utilizing or maybe figure out like, oh, I, I actually should be doing these things. My org doesn't do this today. Mm -hmm. I should like start using like the AWS code deployment or co code pipeline process that's defined and exists. And for a lot of orgs, that might not be something that ever, like somebody put it together many years ago and then never touched it. And so somebody knows how you click a button and things get deployed to prod. Well, now you can actually make sure that that is documented in code, it's in the cloud, it's a repeatable process versus like maybe a more human automated process in the back end. So I think there's a lot of benefit from, from getting on board with that cloud enablement from a software development lifecycle, looking at it through a security lens. Uh, in addition, there's so many different services now that have been adding in security concepts to those pipelines. So before you might have been mired in like, well, developers don't really want to do security. So we're not going to look at security concepts within the existing model. As you move into cloud, like GitHub makes it really easy to just add in security checks. Like mm -hmm. there are tons of open source projects where you can now automatically get security concepts where before it was really difficult or you have to write them yourselves. So there's definitely like a democratization of these types of technologies that helps security achieve their objectives by just getting, getting into the process and being a part of that discussion. So I think there's definitely a lot of benefit to, to actually pu pushing for those things because now we can achieve some of those things that maybe in the past were relegated to ancient technologies that either precluded us from a security standpoint or like nobody really knew how to inject security into that, in that pipeline. There's a lot of benefit from that perspective. Yeah, interesting. So Raquel, if we can throw up our first poll and when while that's going up and, and folks can respond to that, um, it's interesting that you bring that up, Spencer, really looking at it from a legacy perspective. And now uh, it, looking at cloud as an opportunity to get us where we would like to go from a security perspective, right? It's interesting that the existing technologies and legacy investments may in fact have been preventing us in a way from achieving the level of security that we were hoping that we would like to achieve. And I've, you know, I've heard this a number of different times. It's we've sort of inherited a legacy set of investments and we're trying to work around these. Cloud affords us the opportunity now to go and to examine, you know, how do we extend that and evolve security into cloud. Now it doesn't do away with legacy investments, right? But it affords us now something that we can perhaps consider additional ways that we can improve and maybe start to consider migration paths. And, and it starts to get into the full application lifecycle and rationalization activities to sort of consider where, where, you know, where we might go with the cloud. Um, so we've got some responses. It's been up for about a minute or so. So maybe Raquel, if you can post the responses publicly, let's see what folks are looking at here. Um, 
so if we look at it, we've got most people have full support of the business and are well underway with cloud. We've got uh, about a third of the respondents on the, on the webinar have a strong business case and will be starting soon. Uh, and then we've got some are who are in the midst, about a quarter, about a fifth roughly, are in the midst of building the business case. And we've got a, a small percentage that where it's not a priority. So most of them are either in the midst of building a business case right now or are already well underway. It's sort of the, the uh, you know, the cloud enablement seems to be largely something that is an enabling activity today. And we're moving forward with that. And I'd like to just kind of put this out there. I mean, Spencer, you're living the cloud. So for you, clearly, this is, you know, already your, you know, stuff you're looking at. But in your discussions within the industry, does this resonate with you? Are you seeing most people have, in fact, embraced the cloud and are moving forward with it at this point? Yeah, I, I think so. And this kind of echoes. So I used to be a, a deputy CISO for an energy company in, in the Houston area. And when I was there, like that was that we were in that transitionary phase. Um, and so we were like literally throwing everything up into the cloud. So, and that was like two or three years ago. So to see the, the spread of more folks are now either fully in cloud or well on the way. Uh, I think, it, I mean, that, that just solidifies, it is a reality. It is a thing that people are doing. Um, if anything, just from a cost perspective, uh, you know, like that, that for me, when I talk to my peers or talk to other CIOs in, in various industries, like that, that appetite is, is, Amazing, like being able to just reduce cost if you do it if you do it correctly. There's a lot of like really bad cloud migration, so don't get me wrong; it's not like magical. But if you do a, a migration right, like there, there's a lot of, of benefit from doing that. So I think that's you know, and I, I look at it as well as it, it, we're now being able to standardize on particular things that us from a security technology perspective have to worry about, like putting things in AWS means I just need to learn AWS or need, if I go to Azure, I just need to learn Azure. Like I'm not, no, I'm no longer having to like bifurcate all of my understanding of different operating systems and different networking technologies. And like, that's just how AWS networking works in a particular way. Once you learn it, you're good. So I think it's, it's a blessing and a curse because it's new tech, but then it is also a, a narrowing of the field of you now have a, a, you know, a much more complicated thing to understand, but it's just one of those things or maybe two if you're multi-cloud. So uh, I think it's very it's very promising. Yeah, interesting. So there was a, a great comment that just came in. Uh, you know, one thing that was not in our poll is there may be organizations that are ready to go in and to do DevOps, to do cloud. However, their customers are reluctant and want to stay in legacy environments, for example, right? Uh, and, and so this is a real challenge, right? You want to move forward, you see the opportunities, uh, but for whatever reason, whether the business case or the investments, uh, the, the customers are not willing to go and start to move forward from a cloud perspective. And so I think from that standpoint, um, does a discussion like this afford any opportunities for those that perhaps could go and share information with customers. Again, it, it's up to the customer to decide. I think, Ihan, you had mentioned earlier, you know, things around risk and maybe talking about some of these areas of risk. But how would you respond to something like that, Ihan, specifically? Right. Again, I think, as I mentioned before, right, uh, from kind of just a strategic perspective, you need to understand why did they kind of just your customers are reluctant to the kind of just to go to the cloud, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, I mean, once you have this kind of just the idea and you are going to kind of just show them how the security practitioners can kind of just sort of enable the business in this cloud journey, right? Uh, of course, you have to do kind of just some things differently in your example. I mean, if you are kind of just uh, uh, trying to do kind of just a risk assessment uh, in the old days, I mean, it would take uh, weeks, if not months, to kind of just complete a risk assessment. But right now with the DevOps, they are kind of sort of pushing a button over there and they are in the production within minutes, right? You have to kind of just adjust your risk assessment and threat modeling kind of just to the activities so that you can support uh, these kind of just, uh, you know, the, the uh, initiatives over there, right? Mm -hmm. Once you go to the kind of just to your clients or your customers uh, with these kind of just to the solutions, how you can kind of just to enable the security uh, into the CICD pipeline, et cetera. And I think they'll be more uh, willing to, to kind of, sort of listen to you. This is what I can advise, right? Yeah, it's really interesting. Anytime there's a disruptive technology, uh, and I include cloud as being disruptive uh, with 
some of the things that we talked about here. I think uh, we we have to also take a look and to see it from the standpoint of, uh, you know, there will always be a tension, you know, to try and uh, absorb this new technology, this disruptive technology that's out there? Do we want to keep it in place? Do we want to work around it? Do we want to try and gradually ease into it? And these are all really important business decisions that need to get made, um, you know, with the end that there are clearly some benefits. Uh, there are additional aspects beyond the discussion we're having today, uh, which I think have a play in this, uh, you know, organizations, maybe there's mergers, acquisitions, there's uh, regulatory reasons or, or whatever, you know, there may be reasons why people may not want to immediately migrate to the cloud. What we are trying to highlight here are from a security perspective, what would be the benefits of going to the cloud uh, when we look at, at, at cloud enablement from a business perspective. So Ruth, I'd like to get your thoughts as well. Uh, you know, we put the poll up. Uh, we have a lot of folks that are kind of in the, uh, you know, uh, the stage where at least they're building a business case, but most are, are actually in process or are well underway from a cloud adoption standpoint. Does this confirm what you're seeing in the discussions you're having out there as well? Oh, absolutely. I think a lot more people are willing to experiment because the tools are making it easier. I mean, Spencer mentioned GitHub as a prime example, but when you start to look at things like GitHub Actions, it's all there for you. You don't need to understand a lot to be able to get something up and working. And yes, of course, that has the, the negative effect of, well, they're going to build something quickly without knowing too much. So you have to make sure that they're pulling in the right things. And, and But that's Again, we can automate all of those kind of scripts for them. Mm -hmm. On the other side of it, the, the idea of uh, legacy systems, there's a couple of companies that I deal with fairly regularly, and they're doing COBOL on a mainframe. And you're going, yes, we can move that on piece by piece, slowly. You know, it doesn't have to be this big jump. Let me show you something small that I can do. I, I can speed up, I can make that more efficient, and I can keep it secure on that small piece. Once you see that, then you'll be okay. It's about trying to educate them. And, and that's been brought up both by Spencer and I had already. Like it, it's about understanding what you can and can't do and getting over the fear. And you have to try it. It's like anything else. If you don't try it once, you're never going to know. So do it on something small, something that you don't, uh, that's not mission critical. Understand it, then move forward. But we've got to do that. That hugely involves buy-in from managers, from leaders. And that's going back to the earlier, people are the most important asset. The people that you need to convince are the top level managers who know nothing about this. So you've to speak their language and that can be hard. Definitely mm -hmm. that can be hard. Mm -hmm. Interesting, we, we started talking about process and the conversation has evolved now into building a business case and bringing people on. And this usually happens whenever you start to talk about process and governance, now you've got different people involved and uh, you know there, there has to be some oversight. There has to be some execution. We're trying to be lean. We're trying to be efficient. We're trying to, to be responsible and not add additional cost where, where it's not necessary. But in order to do this, we have to get all these stakeholders together without, again, getting into a massive process re-engineering exercise, but just looking at it purely from a cloud adoption standpoint, we've got legacy applications. The goal isn't a massive universal lift and shift. Can we take bits and pieces of this and see how we might be able to migrate that, right? And sort of take yeah. it forward. Um, yeah. So that, that generally, yeah, that's the approach that, I, that I've seen as well, you know, with anything that sort of comes in, build that business case as we, as we move forward. So let's, you know, start to talk now about the technology. Uh, and I think Ruth, you, you kind of opened the door for us on this. Um, when you were talking about technology and doing this incrementally, you know, we're in this cloud, mobile, microservices, serverless, like all these yeah. buzzwords are out there at this point. Let's, let's bring it down a little bit from a security practitioner's perspective, right? When we're looking at technology, what does this mean for a security practitioner, what can they do in this world now where we're moving towards microservices, where we're moving towards serverless and using the cloud as a platform? Thoughts? I'm going to jump in on that one. Yeah, um, go ahead, Do you Ruth. remember the old days of creating your maps of your system? 
and you had to do out your big diagram and you had your effectively a DFD style diagram and you never finished it because you were always being pulled off to do something else and it wasn't important and who cares and this is an urgent crisis anyway and you never got the system drawn out never mind finishing the threat model itself to actually get somewhere now we've got these automated systems that will go out find out what systems are connected what ports are open what applications are running them all of that is done automatically as was already said it's done at a push of a button now we can map that against what we had baselined and what we had expected and we can build our documentation directly first so it's making our job easier if we want to use the tools but we have to understand one there are tools there and two how to use the tools to get the most out of them for whatever it is we need at that time but we're not going to do the whole thing in one go we have to take one tool figure out how we're using it apply it on a small level so plan it out strategize it's already been mentioned plan it out so that we understand we're going to do this this is our goal for this month this is our goal for next month and we build up layer upon layer until we have our system secure mm -hmm. interesting and i'd like to kind of probe a bit deeper on this so we have this infrastructure that we've had, which is on premise, uh, or, or or maybe we've got like a managed, uh, you know, environment, uh, and now we're moving to the cloud, uh, and so this idea of a perimeter is starting to get a little bit kind of hazy, right? Yes, we can put a fence around what's happening in the cloud and where we're kind of doing things internally, uh, but as we start to interact more and more with these distributed applications that we have, Spencer, I'd like to kind of you know get your thoughts on this idea that security as well is shifting away from a perimeter-based model into something that now moves us into applications and data security. Is that is that a fair assessment? Like, what are your thoughts around that? Yeah, I was actually thinking like the MNN model is a good approach to start with cloud migration. Um, and your question <laughs> is like the exact opposite of that. So, I mean, it depends on your journey within the your security lifecycle for, for doing a cloud adoption, right? Like the m, &M approach, which is the hard outside and the soft inside, that is a legit thing to ap approach a cloud environment with. Like you can set up individual VPCs, you can do your old school networking firewalls. Mm -hmm. um, like I, practically every place still uses that. Like there's still a requirement to restrict networking traffic. Um, so I think there's still value there. And this, this I think we're rebranding the phrase, uh, like guardrails is the new look at perimeter. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Like people yeah, yeah. are like, well, you just need to build out guardrails. That's that's great. That that is essentially like the guardrail is the last line of defense before things go off the off the rails, I guess, pun intended. Um, but that like that is still a thing. And defining what are those guardrails, defining what are the, the scenarios that we think are the riskiest or the things that we actually care about. Like maybe you don't care if microservices are talking to each other within a particular account or VPC or side or blood. Like, there, there are decisions that you make from a risk tolerance standpoint that then you know what your guardrail is and you def, you're able to define rules and configurations within the cloud providers or within your existing logging infrastructure, which is often enhanced by cloud providers uh, to say, these are the scenarios that we want to be alerted on and take action on and, and let, let everyone, at, like net, let app teams, let networking teams do what they need to do to enable the business to move fast and, and, and break things. But we know that these are the, the bare minimums of things that we want to alert on, right? Wide open security groups in AWS. That is a very common type of rule that we have here at Reddit, probably have at everywhere else. Uh, that's when things get bad, right? So it's it's just you kind of you figure out what are those things that you can guard against and build those rules out of it. Uh, and whether that's cloud enabled, whether that's open source projects, there's plenty of uh, different tooling that people have put together that said this is this is how we can view the cloud from a security lens, and then you can make informed decisions based on the data that these tools are bringing back to you, uh, whether it's commercial or open source. Like there's a lot of data there that you can then figure out what you're doing. Uh, mm -hmm. It does get a little dicier when you're talking about like lambdas and pure applications, things that are like you're writing code and just shipping it out to go somewhere. Um, but oftentimes the the meat of the processing still sits behind like an API gateway or still sits behind some sort of threshold where that's where you can do your security evaluation. So I, I think there's still uh, there's still some hope that that an MNM type type atmosphere works, but 
once you once you get that structure in place, then you're able to go and deep dive into, well, let's see how we can harden this particular environment, right? If there's appetite to do that, if there's the willingness to take on that overhead to do it, like it's all a risk benefit trade off. Um, so it just it depends on that threshold with which your work falls within. Yeah, interesting. And, and, and really now, you know, we, we start with where we are today. You can't make an immediate jump, but, you know, there are other organizations out there that are trying to, to see, you know, is there a, this, this emerging paradigm uh, of, of trying to get um, not just network security, but looking at it from other perspectives as well to try and reduce the risk because we've got privacy concerns that are coming in, for example, right? And so if we've got data that now resides in the cloud, how do we still ensure that we're managing this from a privacy standpoint of which security is an enabler for privacy, for example? So Ihan, I'd like to turn over to you from a technology standpoint, right? We've got this kind of microservices serverless environment that's out there where, uh, you know, we'd like to make use of it, but, you know, what do we do from a technology standpoint as a security community to help enable the business going forward? Right. And Alphas, as you mentioned, you have to kind of just identify, protect, detect, respond and recover the security threats, vulnerabilities and incidents, whether you're on cloud or kind of on-prem, right? Doesn't matter, right? And of course you have to kind of just reuse the technologies so that you can kind of just sort of match the pace of the cloud kind of just the initiatives over there. And of course you have to kind of just use the automation as much as possible. Right. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the kind of just the, the security incidents uh, coming from the, the cloud, we see that the cloud misconfigurations are quite common over there, right? And when we look at the kind of the, the root cause, why, I mean, this is the cloud misconfigurations are kind of, sort of so common, we, we see that the, the uh, a few things that is important. Number one is, is the lack of visibility because on the cloud, you are kind of just losing some kind of just sort of visibility over there, right? And also if you are using it outdated security models, or if you have some kind of inexperience kind of just to the uh, users over there, then these security misconfigurations are kind of just quite common. However, as Ruth mentioned and Spencer kind of just to, uh, reinforced that, you need to automate the deployment of the cloud systems so that it can meet your security, privacy, and also the compliance requirements, right? Unfortunately, many traditional today, the hardware-based security tools for the, let's say that the network visibility is not gonna work, right? For the cloud environments. The, the new cloud model, this is kind of just sort of changing as you mentioned, this is from the, the software-based and ungoverned uh, by its very nature, right? Right now everything is this kind of just a software defined parameter, right? Uh, from the technology perspective, I would like to kind of just add something that I see is a kind of, so there's a big gap over there, right? Uh, organizations sometimes are funny. They hire the, the smart people and you're hiring those people not to kind of sort of tell them what to do, right? You're hiring those smart people uh, so that they can tell what you need to do. So you need to involve them and leverage their expertise, enable and empower them with a kind of just sort of platform, a communication platform where all the kind of just sort of the employees can contribute and co-create these either the security artifacts or the other kind of just to sort the of cloud related artifacts over there, right? The, the platform that we will be kind of just providing, it should be facilitating the, the communication between these different stakeholders, right? I think this is the, the biggest gap from technology mm. perspective. We do not communicate. There are kind of just the silos over there, even at this uh, cloud, they are doing things kind of just uh, without talking to each other. We have to bring those people into the one platform and enable them to, to communicate uh, from technology perspective. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. So, so far in the discussion that we've had today, and we've looked at this from a people process and technology standpoint, really looking at it as a security practitioner's perspective. And there's a ton of information here, you know, and, and each one of these could merit its own discussion to go forward and say, okay, what does it mean, for example, when we talk about shared responsibility? What does it mean when we talk about retooling individuals? But what I'd like to do in the short time that we've got left, and I'm hoping we can squeeze this in, uh, I'd like to go back now and look at all of these things that we've looked at from a people process and technology standpoint and try to articulate, if we start now to do these things as security practitioners, how do we measure whether we're on the right track? Are there certain metrics? Are there certain uh, 
key, uh, you know, variables we should be monitoring, uh, anything like that. So I'd like to start off from from the people perspective, and maybe it's you know as simple as saying from a people standpoint, let's monitor how many people are getting trained on cloud, as an example, and that becomes one metric that we could use to measure whether or not we're headed in the right direction. But let me just back up a second. And I'd like to start with you, Ruth, from your perspective, what are some concrete measurements as security practitioners we can put to measure the cloud enablement capabilities that security is bringing to the table? Yeah, I, I'm just gonna agree with you on that one. One of the simple measures is to see who's been trained up on it. And people use that all the time as a good basic measure. But what they forget is they don't check on it later on because this shouldn't be a static measurement. This should be an ongoing rolling measurement. And no matter what measurement we look at, we're not doing that. We're, we're measuring it once off or ticking a box. Mm -hmm. That's all we're doing is ticking a box and saying, yes, we have it done. And that's not sufficient. So whether we look at our services, what services have moved over to cloud? Well, they moved over, but what was the gain? Why did you move it over? And did you achieve the gain that you expected? If not, why not? It's all of these retrospectives. Again, go back to what I had said. So look at the ongoing, keep renewing, keep reviewing, and make sure that you make those improvements. Yeah. So sort of continuous improvement uh, happening mm -hmm. as well. So I think, um, you know, it, it's really interesting when we look at uh, this whole idea of, of even training and, and how we can use that to, to change behavior. Uh, you, you know, it, it really is making sure that we've got these regular touch points. It's not a one time check off the box. We did it. And let's look at this the following year. But if you can, and ideally, if it's in situ, so while you're in that situation, you're trying to discover, uh, you, you know, and you can afford some opportunities to come alongside people to help retool them. And that's one way of doing this and, and trying to create this opportunity for, for everybody to, to sort of come along. Um, Spencer, your thoughts, any additional metrics from a people standpoint you can think about? Yeah, I, I think, you know, there's a lot of buzzwords around like 360 feedback and NPS scores mm -hmm. and, and basically whatever your org uses to kind of gather feedback, like the thing I've used this in the past too, is, is get a litmus of how security is able to communicate with people that are diving into the cloud. And if there is a communication gap or they ex like they're expecting security to come to the table with more knowledge about things like that's that's how you can understand if there is a skills gap right because at the end of the day i really want a security architect to be able to go with a, a network architect or a cloud architect whoever's leading that that effort to get up to the cloud they need to speak the same language right because cloud is a new language that you need you do need to go and learn um if, if there is a mismatch there, then, then something needs to happen, right? Mm -hmm. like retooling needs to be done, some way to facilitate that communi continuous communication. Because like, as I had mentioned, if you can't talk to each other, it's cloud, like, like this doesn't matter with the cloud, like this is a classic security problem. If you can't speak the language, you're not gonna get anywhere. So I, I really like you know, understanding you know, if it's feedback surveys, like we've done Google feedbacks, uh, like forum requests to ask to people like, how are we doing? What's our NPS score internally within security? Uh, those types of things are extremely helpful. And that gives you a quantitative metric that you could do periodically, quarter over quarter, half year, like some sort of frequency to say, how are we doing? How does the org perceive us uh, on this cloud, cloud enablement journey? And like maybe that also extends into other areas too. Like how are we doing from a, not just cloud adoption, but other things within the security ecosystem. There's a lot of things to get feedback and, and culture evaluation in that space. Mm, that's great. Ihan, your thoughts? So far, we've got training, continuous improvement, and retros, 360 feedback, surveys, anything from the people perspective that you'd like to add to this? Right. I mean, Altas, uh, metrics aren't just a series of numbers over there, right? They should reflect the company vision, and they should also help everyone in the organization understand how their work impacts the business in a positive way. Uh, there was a question in the audience. Uh, I think uh, someone was asking, hey, to the automation cloud, this is going to kind of just eliminate the kind of just uh, the, the workforce and the people are scared of that. No, I think this is going to kind of just increase the kind of just the, the pleasure of working, right? And if you want to kind of just sort of measure that one, because people, when they get engaged, they are going to kind of, sort of contribute to the success of the organization. And one of the measurements is this kind of the quality of the work over there that can kind of, sort of come into the picture uh, here. 
Mm, that's great. Okay, I'd like to keep us uh, moving forward. I wish we had another hour, <laughs> uh, but let's take a look at it from a process standpoint now. So we talked about a, a bunch of stuff when it comes to uh, the, the process side as well, um, making it multidisciplinary, aligning business priorities with risk, articulating policies, moving into a service mindset, but let's ground this. How are we going to measure something like this? And uh, Spencer, I'd like to start with you. If you've got some thoughts from a process standpoint, what are some of the metrics that we could use? Yeah, I think from a from like a, a heat map or as a, a capabilities matrix, whatever your org is familiar with, like those these security concepts, and are they being represented in that cloud migration? Um, and then to understand, and this is very like CIS top controls, but just for a cloud migration, like that's kind of where, mm -hmm. like that's, I've used that before to just say, how are we doing? Where are the, the skill sets or capabilities that might not exist as we're moving things up? So if we're a DevSecOps shop, like, are we doing SAS DAS external scanning? Like there's a whole rubric of things that we could be doing and what's being done and how well they are being performed, right? Meaning are we getting results? Is it driving actions? Is it reducing the, the overall risk to the org? I, I find splaying that out as a heat map is extremely effective and, and visualized. People can understand that. Certainly execs can be able to understand that. And that helps drive understanding of wh where you're doing good, where you're doing bad. And if that matches up with your threat model, your risk appetite within an organization. Hmm. It's interesting. I think uh, we could, uh, and this is sort of a good segue. I think let's throw up our second poll, which is really around the, the value from a, from a security perspective. And while that poll is up there and, and folks are answering that, I'd like to turn this over and, uh, you know, Ihan, your thoughts on any additional process metrics that, that you kind of see? Sure. Uh, that there are tons of metrics out there, but one of my favorites is, is the GRC related metric uh, that would be percentage of risk assessment performed for the cloud initiatives, right? Since we mentioned that it's a kind of the fast paced environment, right? And how do we kind of just, uh, you know, the, the manage the, the risk and threat modeling over there? Uh, that would be kind of a wonderful uh, metric to, to kind of just to measure. But there are tons of other things as well that you can kind of do from uh, the, the process perspective, like, for example, business continuity and operational resilience recovery time, maybe, right? And the change control and configuration management kind of just sort of metrics. Uh, as I mentioned, there are tons of metrics over there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Interesting. Ruth, your thoughts? Uh, just one of them that maybe is often forgotten is to look at where the calls are coming from. You know you're changing behavior. You know you're getting an actual change overall in the process. If the calls for security and security information are coming from the teams, coming from ground level as well as coming from leadership. And I think that that definitely shows that your processes are beginning to work. Hmm. Interesting. And, and just in looking at the poll results, um, you know, three quarters of the audience feels that lack of strong governance is the biggest challenge when it comes to cloud adoption. And that's come up several times in our discussion today. And when we talk about governance, it includes roles, responsibilities, controls, cross-functional um, sharing of information, you know, all these things now tie into making sure we've got a good, strong governance program. So rather than just migrating to the cloud uh, and then trying to retrofit existing uh, governance processes, we, we perhaps need to, to stop and reconsider, you know, what are some of the new things that we need to bring in? Because there will be these additional capabilities that Spencer was bringing up as a heat map. We can identify where these challenges lie. And so when we start to develop a governance program around cloud, we know what it is that we're going to have to do. And then we can augment that and to help ease this transition over onto the cloud, for example. Um, and let's uh, flip over now and, and take a look at this from the perspective of technology. So when we look at technology, we really looked at automated scanning, uh, looking at things really around uh, using existing networking, uh, trying to get information at the perimeter, trying to get security related data from applications and, and the information that resides in these applications as an example. But let, let's again, let's ground this. Ihan, your thoughts on uh, technology metrics that we can use uh, as it pertains to, to cloud? 
Right. One of the things that my favorite, again, matrix from technology perspective is the number of the unidentified devices on your internal networks, right? As we mentioned, I mean, the, the kind of to the cloud is a different beast from kind of just, the, you know, the monitoring perspective. And this shows how well you are visibility for the asset management. But there are tons of mm -hmm. other things as well. Mm -hmm. Spencer, your thoughts? Yeah, I like where where his head was at because basically, like you should know what everything is, is up in the cloud. Being able to understand who owns what, what teams are they appropriated to, like at like asset management and inventory management is the best metric because if you can't tell what things are or you can't allocate them to particular places, then you you're probably missing some element within your your governance perspective. And then I think there's plenty of of, of commercial vendors and open source projects that will do kind of a litmus test and evaluation of your cloud footprint. So whether that's something as simple as like a trusted advisor, like that is a metric. It's it's a very uh, vanilla metric, a very remedial one, but like that's where you can start and you can increasingly progress. There's plenty of vendors that will sell you like a cloud security suite, but you know there's plenty of frameworks that might not be an official standard quite yet. Hopefully we'll get there, but you know, a, a pick one, adopt it, and that, that you can use that as your rubric to evaluate how are we doing, right? And it goes, especially if, you, if you're not going to go that route, understanding what are the things that you actually care about. So the like number of rules of guardrails, the frequency at which they happen. So like if I take the example of an open security group uh, to the wide internet, how often does that happen? Is it actually being tied back to uh, infrastructure as code change or somebody opening up something random in production willy nilly? Like. Those are all great examples of, from a like an incident response post-mortem of the things that you actually care about that can help produce metrics to say, yeah, we're doing good from a governance perspective in the cloud, or it's just a wild, wild west and we totally need help and to put some sort of governance pr uh, program in place ASAP. Mm, interesting. And it's, uh, you know, when we take a look at risk and risk management, risk assessment, the first stage is really identifying the assets in question. And then only after that, can you start to consider what's the risk uh, threshold that we're willing to accept against a, a given asset, for example. Uh, and I know that we're talking about assets as though, you know, oh yeah, you just go in and collect it. And that's a whole other conversation mm -hmm. uh, about how do we go in there and, and how do we manage some of these assets, especially when, uh, you know, we're in an age where you could go in there and, and uh, create a whole bunch of these assets, um, you know, and, and it's not easy to, to kind of wrap our heads around. And maybe in the future, we'll start to talk about, you know, have a webinar on, on how do you do cloud asset management or, or actually hybrid asset management at that point. But I do want to give Ruth an opportunity. Ruth, your thoughts on metrics from a technology perspective. I'm just going to follow on the same thought. Um, knowing what you have was one thing. And we say, okay, what, what do we not know that's out there? But even those that you do know, one of the things we have to measure is whether we evaluated the priority properly. Is there something there, you know it's there and you go, yeah, I, I'm gonna get rid of that. I'm gonna harden that up. I'm gonna do this, but it's dropping lower and lower on the priority list and you don't get around to it. And then three months, six months later, there's this thing there that you've completely forgotten about. It, it's sitting there. You kind of know it's there, but you're not dealing with it. If that's the case, we're not dealing with our priorities properly. So our process is broken. I mean, it's a good indicator of mm. broken processes. Yeah. So how long are the risk priorities, you know, delayed? Uh, and, and we do need to go in and we do need to take a look at these things. Uh, so, you know, Ruth, Ihan, Spencer, thank you very much for your time. It's been an amazing discussion. I think I'd like to hand it off at this point to Raquel and you can bring us to a land. Thanks everyone. Yes, thank you so much again um, for a great session. I wanted to just quickly throw up one more poll. This is more of a discovery poll. Um, the poll we have here. Uh, is would you like to see what how uh, sorry would you like to see how SD elements can offer you a starting point to planning your move to cloud? Um, we did get a few questions that came in for the Q and A, but maybe we can just quickly answer one before we wrap up. The question here is: the cloud is evolving so rapidly. How can a security practitioner keep up? Okay. You're never going to keep up fully, though, are you? I mean, you can say you are, but you're never. And that's the whole point. You wouldn't be in computing if you like to stand still. You're in the wrong job. No matter what it is you do, and, and all of these people, I love to meet people who say they're a guru or an expert in, because you're wrong.
you're just wrong. Nobody can be. You just, you do your best, you plan out your time, you keep your research going and, and, and there is a certain amount of hoping for the best. There really is. Ayan, your thoughts? How does a practitioner keep up? Uh, you sharpen the soul, Altas. I mean, the, the technology is kind of just changing very rapidly, right? Mm -hmm. And kind of just to try to, to kind of just to get more knowledge and kind of just to, you know, on this so that you can kind of just focus on the, the maybe you are not doing the, the things greatly because your governance is not allowing you, but you can kind of start doing small things greatly, right? With the kind of just mm -hmm. education that you get. Mm -hmm. Spencer, your thoughts? I think there's a, a, a lot of benefit in understanding the breadth first step on where you need to be and when it's when it is the appropriate time to reach out to it, consult that expert and pull in additional support. Mm -hmm. There's a lot, I mean, technology was hard before cloud. Technology is even a lot harder to, to fully comprehend with cloud. And as things are changing and like, look at how quickly Kubernetes and, and things along those lines are evolving, it's extremely hard to keep up. But security concepts luckily are staying roughly the same. So it's just understanding how do you apply those concepts within that that space. And so if, if you need additional outside help, like understand when, when it is time to phone that friend and get additional tech support to understand everything. Yeah. I mean, I've, I found from my own experience, it's, uh, it's just the velocity that that's really trying to keep up with that is, is what's the biggest challenge. And I found one way to help mitigate that is get involved, get into communities, um, you know, get involved in, in working groups, uh, even if you can get into standards groups. I mean, there's stuff that OWASP does. There's stuff that, you know, the open group does some things out there. We've got uh, Linux Foundation, OpenSSF. There's a bunch of communities that are out there. Uh, and just hearing what other people have to say and the diversity of those discussions can help to make sure that you stay up to speed as well. But as Ruth had mentioned in the opening comments, nobody knows everything. The best we could do now is just try to help each other out as we go forward with this. Uh, Raquel, I'd like to hand it over to you at this point. Awesome. Well, thank you so much again for a great session. Like I mentioned, uh, just let everybody know all of our webinars as they begin scheduling will be added to the resources section of our website. So please feel free to visit and register to those. We hope everyone found this presentation insightful. And again, we will, we will be providing a link to the recording of the webinar here via email. And thank you so much for attending. Stay safe and have a great day.